Okay. Right. So uh, thanks for joining and uh, thanks for inviting me, Thomas, along to this Harper Forum. Uh, it's been quite a long time since I was at Harper, but I am an ex-Harperite and uh, know the college very well. So um, it's, uh, like I say, been a long time. And in terms of, of who I am and where I'm from and that sort of thing, uh, I'm a technical director for business management at ADAS currently. Uh, a farmer as well from North Lincolnshire and uh, spent 20 years milking cows and then uh, got into consultancy and had um, a spell with Promart and then went into the banking world and uh, had three or four years in the banking world and then came out of that and set up an asset finance business and then uh, found myself going back again to uh, to Promar uh, as, a, as a senior consultant and work my way up to, uh, to managing director, which I was managing director of Promar for five years up until uh, March last year and uh, made the move across to, uh, to ADAS. So really that's a little bit of background about me. Really what I wanna talk about tonight is, is the building of a, a resilient farm business. You know, clearly what we're going through with COVID what we're going through with the agricultural uh, transition and all that uh, that, that uh, will bring upon the farming community. The word resilience does uh, resonate somewhat. And I'm just, you know, as we've not got many on the call, if they're all unmuted, Thomas, just a little bit of audience participation wouldn't be a bad thing. So but just a quick question as to what you guys think. Um, is what is resilience? Yeah, so I've, um, I've given everyone the option um, to talk, so you just have to um, unmute yourselves, um, guys, if you wanted to talk. So you can do that at your end. That's fine. It's, it's gone a bit quiet. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's absolutely fine. So. Um, so in terms of a, of a definition, it's, uh, it's really adjusting easily to misfortune or change. And I think change is the big word there. So uh, it's the idea that, you know, you can bend but not break. So what I just want to go through now is uh, there's a short video that I've got here. And I'm hoping and praying that you guys can hear it all. It's really from a more business you know, a more general business viewpoint. Um, and it's uh, been put together by McKinsey's. So I apologize for a bit of the, uh, the American accents on here, um, but I think it is quite a useful exercise just to listen to, to the video. So I'll roll that now, hopefully everybody. While economic forecasters debate when the next downturn will hit, the pressing question for business leaders isn't when, it's how to avoid the next recession. To help answer that question, what's the resilience Thomas, can you see that or are you just seeing the screen? um we've just got a screen at the moment we did have some audio right okay let me just uh, let me just try something else then so you should be able to see it now but it's just whether you can hear it that's the that's the only issue uh we can see it yeah uh, there's a bit of volume there Thank you. 
Okay, so I, I, I hope you saw it <laughs> at least rather than, uh, um, than probably not hearing it, but there was some subtitles there. But I think really that for me sums up what resilience is about in terms of the wider business community. But what I want to sort of think about now is, you know, applying that to a farming business. So if you're managing a farm business, you should think as a business leader would think. And I think traditionally we're not good at that as farmers. You know, we do tend to think that we've got an occupation that is more of a lifestyle than a business. But I think applying those rules in terms of, of looking at your, at your business as a business leader would do, I think that's really relevant to do so. And then there's a few points here that really, I think, hit home at what a, um, a business leader should be thinking about in terms of resilience. So it's measuring beyond performance. So measure, 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 and, uh, and collect and use data to affect uh, to, to affect change and drive continual improvement. You know, I know Harper are very aligned to to data and uh, and the whole use of technology. So that that to me is not just about collecting data; it's using it effectively, and then looking forward. You know, in terms of in terms of planning, 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 and turning any challenges that may uh, may appear into opportunities, I think it's really important because it's far too easy to look back uh, and not look forward. Um, the challenge is looking forward and planning. But then, as the video alluded to, you know, seeking ad advantage in adversity. If you get things in in order in a business you can take on these challenges and be ahead of the game when change strikes and then when that adversity comes around you can actually take advantage of those of that adversity having a collaborative view so you know it's it's not just about you as a business leader it's about all the stakeholders within your business and with that you know it's employees it's customers it's family, it's relations, it's, it's everybody, it, it's bankers, you know, it's, uh, it's consultants, it's vets. And, and having that collaborative view and taking, uh, taking advice from a lot of people is the way forward. And then the whole idea of, of diversification. I mean, we talk about diversification all the time. We think probably um, diversification is, is about tourism and you know, having a glamping pot on your farm or something like that. No, it's not. It's about all sorts of different diversifications in terms of income streams. And then the biggest elephant in the room I always feel is change. So, you know, the idea that uh, change is the norm and, um, and allowing iterative incremental adjustments rather than one massive one shot adjustment because change happens and it's happening all the time you know evolution is what it is because of change so it's something that we shouldn't fear it's something that we should absolutely um take on board and be ready for and accept it will happen because without a doubt it does happen but i just wanted to to really have a quick look at farmer behavior because i really feel strongly a lot of uh, a lot of what goes on in the farming world is down to behaviors and not just far in the farming world you know this is this is commonplace uh, throughout all businesses and uh, and really the whole the whole idea about behavior is is just how uh, how farmers and people on farms um, think about things so this is a piece of work from a few years ago now um, that, uh, that we carried out in terms of a study across the whole of Europe looking at farmer behaviours. And we, we actually segmented this into, into four different categories. And so on the top left hand corner, we've got survivors. I just want, as we talk through these, I just want you to think about 
uh, farms at home, farms that you may have worked on, and just think about the characters and personalities on those farms. So the survivor is somebody who probably inherits his farm when he's 65. Uh, his predecessor has still got, has still got the checkbook at 85. Um, probably very reluctant to change, has a, has a hands-on role and limited and often inherited knowledge. So this is the guy who's leaning on the, on the gate. And, uh, and this is how we do it, boy, and this is how we've always done it, sort of mentality and very reluctant in terms of you know, bringing new technology onto the farm. Then down the bottom left-hand corner, you've got doers, and these probably have got more of a hands-on role. So they're, they're working all the time, they're on a tractor, they're milking their cows. They're probably quite good in terms of, of technical, uh, technical performance of their, of their enterprises, and, uh, but they rely on suppliers for, for advice. And they very often think about, you know, the harder I work, the more successful I'll be. Um, but technically they're very good, but they don't spend any time in the office. They're basically on a track to working and they probably think that there's only them that can do the job um, right, if you like. And then moving into the, onto the right hand side at the bottom there, you've got the managers. So these are people who, who have got the, the technical ability but also have um, more, of a, more of the business skills that you need. So they will dedicate more time to the office. They will understand their financial accounts. They will be able to budget and forecast. They will listen to professional advice and take it on board when it's needed. And, and they also have more of an engagement with the primary buyer. They recognize that there is a customer out there and they've got to produce what the customer wants if they're going to move forward and be successful. Then right up in the top right hand corner there, you've got the entrepreneurs and leaders. I mean, this is, an, this is a more of a, it's not an elite group, but it's, it's probably, probably only ever gonna be 5% of the population through in this group. And they're focused on leadership. They, they understand about team building. They, they can manage stuff. They're, they're innovative, you know, if there's a new technology comes out, they'll be the early adopter and they take on new ideas and they, they, they see events coming. They're not, you know, they can adapt to change and adapt very easily, but they also have that intense engagement with the supply chain. So in the dairy world, if you were to stick another hundred cows on that million liters, they would know where the market was for that million liters and they would know at what price they could sell it at roughly and they would have an understanding of, of sensitivity analysis risk management so so basically there's four categories there and what we would like to see is is that arrow basically curving round because ultimately the survivors will not be the future of uk agriculture unfortunately because they're survivors they their price take is the same as everybody else, but they survive because when a price drops, so if the milk price drops, they survive because they've got very little debt. They don't employ anybody. They've got no life expectancy in terms of, um, in terms of going on holiday and, and actually producing a profit so that they can spend it and improve their life. So just a little bit of a snapshot really in terms of farmer behavior, because I think it's really important to take us on board uh, different people have different ways of looking at resilience. So I just want to work through through each of these now. And the first one I'll start with is, is, is measuring performance. So Peter Drucker was a management uh, consultant, Austrian born and, and an American. And he, he came up with this, you can't manage what you don't measure. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard that saying over and over again, but it's absolutely true. You can't manage what you can't measure. And, uh, and so you need to be able to measure stuff. And, uh, and the first thing I'll sort of talk about is the financial data. So Making Tax Digital came along last April, last April, not last April, April 19 now. Um, and so farmers then had to start actually using some sort of software. And I'm sure you're all aware of this, but the idea of using that software to submit their VAT returns 
many farmers, and I see lots of farmers all over the country, many farmers are now either just getting their accountant to do this or their bookkeepers doing it. And really it's about being able to submit their VAT. But what they should really be doing is using that data to allocate costs, to understand enterprise gross margins, to benchmark and use proportional analysis, both internally and externally, in terms of, of how well they're performing. And also producing regular management information reporting. As we go through the whole of the agricultural transition and BPS dis starts to disappear, the banking world will want to take a lot closer look at businesses. They'll want to be able to understand where a business is going financially. They'll want to be able to see forecasts. They'll want to be able to understand if that loan that they're putting up to their credit team <coughs> actually stands on its feet and it can be serviced. So that's what this, this will allow. Uh, data inputting and use of that data will allow a lot easier provision of projections and forecasts. So in the marketplace out there, there's loads of different providers. I mean, there's just a few, there's just a snippet here, a few of those providers, all producing um, HMRC, uh, making tax digital compliant uh, VAT submissions. There's a couple here that I think in particular are quite interesting. And that uh, Zero is a is a product that is absolutely worldwide um, and is an accounting tool. But tagged with Figured, another app that connects to Zero, and some of you probably will have already heard this. I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, but um, the whole idea of using Figured alongside Zero is it uses the it has the ability to use live data. And when I say live, yes, it can be live as in per day. It can be as per tra transaction that goes through the bank but you can then produce uh, forecasts and budgets that are live and you can alter them accordingly. And because it's all cloud-based, you can access or you can grant access to whichever stakeholders in your business you wish to. So it may be that, you know, you've got your, your accountant, which is pretty much nailed on. You know, you'd always, you'd always have your accountant um, viewing that, but you could also have your bank manager, you could have your consultant, and, uh, and the beauty of that is you know, cloud accounting allows everybody to see what, um, what one person's doing. So, I mean, something like this really does only cost a few hundred quid and uh, you know, 20, 20 to 40 pounds a calendar a month is, is nothing if you can analyze those costs, see how you're performing and, uh, and literally save thousands. Um, and it's something that as BPS disappears, there's so many things that you can't influence in a far, on a farm and price usually is one of them. Yes, you can, you know, you can make sure that your, your wheat's at the right protein content. You can make sure that, uh, that your milk is at the right qualities, but really the price um, of agricultural com commodities is exactly that. It's a commodity price and largely we are price takers as farmers. So moaning about price is largely irrelevant. Looking at your own business is not, it's something that you can influence. So the whole idea of, of using a service like this just allows that to happen. And, and like I said before, you know, using financial data to affect change and drive continual improvement is the, is the key here. You know, if, if BPS, uh, starts to disappear quicker than we think it does, this needs to start happening now. People need to start looking and interrogating gross margins and looking for improvement areas as soon as possible. But the other thing here is, is creating mindset change. And, uh, you know, as, we get, as people get older, um, changing a mindset becomes more and more difficult. So, um, in the financial world, you know, checks have been disappearing now for the last 20 odd years and it takes time, but checks will go. I don't have any checks on the farm at home now. 
and uh, and and I think you know, that will become standard practice. And the idea of a paper invoice won't be here in a few years' time, without a shadow of a doubt. The idea that a farmer likes, I hear lots of farmers say, oh, I like to feel the invoice, I like to know what it's about, I want to be able to read it. Well, you can do all that without, you can do everything without having to have a paper invoice in your hand. And that's, that's more of the, where, where this is going. So checks and invoices and receipts printed will go in the bin, in my opinion, over the next few years. And to be honest, I'm be glad when it does, because the idea of paperwork is just time consuming and, uh, and slows everything down. And that time can be used far more effectively in other areas of your business. I mean, this is just basically how it works within the within financial um, systems and, and coding systems. So um, electro, electronic invoice comes in, it, uh, and through, usually through these services, HubDoc, and, um, and this is Receipt Bank down here. So um, the idea then is that there's optical character recognition software that actually then reads the invoice and, uh, and pre-codes it ready for approval, farmer or bookkeeper approves it, and it goes into the accounting software. All done with no paper and, uh, and just so much more efficient, but with the coding structure in place that allows you know, interrogation and uh, an enterprise gross margin um, analysis. The next thing I wanna just look at is, is the looking forward bit. So, Joe Girard was, um, was an, a, a Guinness Book of World Records um, for selling the most cars in a year. Interesting fact for you all. Um, but he had the idea that you had to look back to learn how to look forward. And I, you know, looking back is sometimes looking back at data rather than looking back at ideas. So the idea is of, of looking back to learn how to look forward is really about assessing resources and financials. And this is all the standard stuff. If you're having uh, business management lectures at Harper, you will know all about this. So land, labor, buildings, machinery, equipment, livestock numbers, all the resources that go to make up a farming business, assess them, review them. Where are they? Are the breeds of livestock the right breeds? Have you got enough numbers? Are stocking rates right? You know, so it's, it's looking back as an analysis rather than looking back for ideas. And then the whole piece around profitability um, at Whole Farm, but more importantly, at enterprise gross margin, because that's how you learn how much more profit you could be making. And then using that comparative analysis um, to, to identify the areas that you can improve. But things like lending viability, you know, um, all banks have risk matrix matrices and that lending viability is really important. And your competitiveness, you know, it's coming back to a farm as a business and you have got competitors. They're over every, over every hedge next door to you. They're competitors. And, um, Yes, we're all farmers, but we're all competing in a similar marketplace. And maybe that marketplace is going to change during the next few months, but you know, ultimately there should be a competitiveness. And the other key thing there is just reviewing the actual management skills that you've got on the farm. If they're not there, import them, bring them in and, and, and take, on, take on board some expert advice. It may cost a bit, but it will deliver a multiple so always include those sort of things within that review of, uh, of resources and then it's understanding the future so you know what are your personal objectives what are the business objectives who are the stakeholders map it out you know who are all the people in my in this business that I need to consult and I need to take ideas from but also, you know, all of that is really where you're going to, because if you don't know where you're going to, how do you know where, when you've got there? So having those objectives really important. Um, but also understanding the customers, 
you know, what are the customer's needs? What do you need to supply to hit the best price to make sure that your, um, that your product is sold on time and, and, and hits the cash flow when you want it to hit? But the other thing here, and this is, you know, this is hugely, um, it's a huge problem in agriculture succession. You know, so many times I go on to farms and have you considered succession? No, not even thought about it. And to be honest, I'm not that bothered because um, I'll be dead and, and that won't matter. So they can sort it all out when I'm gone. What a short sighted view that is. You worked all your life to get to where you want to get to. You've achieved everything, but you're not looking at the next generation. You're not thinking about how they're going to take it on and is it tax efficient? Something like uh, 80 odd percent of farm sales, a, a land agent told me this once, something like 80 percent of land sales are due to family fallouts and divorce. So you know, having that succession plan is really important. And the other word in here is carbon mitigation because that is going to be huge uh, without any doubt. ADAS are doing a lot of work currently in the supply chain and um, looking at, at carbon mitigation. And if it's required by the processors and the retailers, it will find its way down the line to the farmers. And very often carbon mitigation can save you money. It doesn't cost you money, it saves you money. So have a plan for carbon mitigation. And then the last one here, you know, how, how will the agricultural transition affect my farm? What's your BPS at the minute? We know it's going to be naught in 2028. We don't know yet. Maybe George Eustace will tell us next month um, just what that reduction will look like for the next seven years. But have a look at it. See what your profit requirement is on the farm. See how much you need to make and how much it's going to be reduced. Because that BPS is news, usually 100% profit. If you've got somebody filling in the form, it maybe is 95% profit. But that's not just revenue going out of your business, that's profit going out of your business. And also looking at, you know, countryside stewardships, conversion to elms. Don't think of BPS being replaced by elms because it won't be. Um, elms is something that will come along that people will be able to engage with. And, and the sustainable farming initiative that, that George Eustace announced a couple of weeks ago now, it's, it's a stepping stone but it's not going to replace BPS. It's, it's something that some people will be able to engage with and others won't. So it's definitely not a replacement. And then the whole impact on markets, you know, we've had the agricultural bill um, amendments all declined this week. So, you know, we are where we are with markets and we don't want um, American <laughs> chlorinated chicken coming in this country, but largely, Again, it's, it's not really in our hands. We can debate and we can lobby and the NFU do a good job of that. But ultimately, it's making your own farm fit first that's, that's the key. And then really it's about sitting down when you've got all of that done, actually documenting a five to 10 year strategy. And don't, when you've done it or you've paid somebody to do it, stick it in the bottom drawer, keep it as a working document look at it on a regular basis as things change it may need changing and and that's the whole point you know a, a, a strategy is a strategy it's not the finished article and it needs to be refined on a probably a two-year cycle to 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 be honest and include a swat and pestle analysis think about risk assessments what are the risks on my business what are the goals and objectives set some kpis back to the if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Set some KPIs. People get motivated if you've got a KPI to drive for. There's nothing better than hitting a KPI because you feel like you've achieved. And again, that's back to behaviors. If you feel like you've achieved and then you can notch that up a little bit more, then everybody feels good about themselves. And that's what it's about. Have a budget and cash flow. Now, again, that will that will need changing because things happen. You know, who would have predicted COVID this time last year? And um, so things do change. 
Staff management, again, you know, hugely neglected in agriculture. In, in the eastern side of the country here, some massive farms with people employed, got no kind of staff management appraisals or recognition or anything going on and uh, hugely uh, underrated part of, uh, of farming and business. You know. And then technology adaption and use of genetics, again, engaging with that process and adopting them as and when they become available and will save you money. Genetics is a huge area for me that still has got a lot more to deliver. So coming then on to um, onto adversity. <clears throat> so I always think of this as a gorge and um, because for a lot of people it's a gorge, but being able to put that ladder across it and make progress against it early on gives you an advantage without a shadow of a doubt. So think about addressing gross margin inadequacies now. If you don't know what the gross margin is for each enterprise, find it out and then address where those problems are. Overhead costs, you know, again, another area that's hugely underestimated in terms of um, things like, you know, negotiating a better deal on your electricity contract or, you know, reviewing your, um, your loans and uh, with interest rates as they are now, you know, is it right that we should, should maybe refinance and just having a look at everything, turn over every stone and make your, fu your business future fit now because getting ahead of the game, we've got seven years now with BPS disappearing, getting ahead of the game now is the way to go to prepare for that. And then, you know, the idea that if you get everything, all your act in order and you get it in hour early, there will be bargains. There will be bargains. There will be opportunities that materialize uh, because of adversity. You know, we can second guess all sorts of things happening post, post Brexit, post agricultural transition, but it will be a an, a an area of change and people farming, the farming whole picture of farming will change without a shadow of a doubt. And, uh, but that excites me because that creates opportunities and it's being getting your business in a place that you're able to um, take on those, um, those advantages when they come along. So the collaborative view um, in, terms of, in terms of having some sort of a plan, you must, must communicate plan. Having um, any sort of arrangement that you've got in place, if you don't communicate that, nobody knows where they're going with it. Communication, again, is a major issue on farm. You go on farms and you see people, you know, talking to their members of staff whilst they're milking the cows or you know there's a bit of tire kicking going on in the morning on an arable farm it's not where you have effective conversations with members of staff where you have effective conversations is where you create you create time and you plan on how you're going to meet people and you how you're going to communicate things so partnering with advisors i would put in this collaboration piece so the really good businesses in this country take advice but they take advice where they've got the gaps in their knowledge. And that's just makes common sense. You know, it may cost, it may cost, but it will deliver. So whenever I sell consultancy, I have to be able to deliver value because if I can't deliver value, at least, at least cover the costs and hopefully two or three times the costs in terms of return value, then I, I I'm not doing a job. So, you know, don't be afraid to take, um, take advice. Joint farming advent, uh, ventures will, without doubt, become more and more apparent as we go through the agricultural transition. Um, and things like equipment sharing and knowledge transfer, financial benchmarking. I mean, AHDB, great organisation, about to produce a, a new strategy, which I'm sure will be a move forward again. Great organisation, get involved with them, share some knowledge and um, share some ideas, benchmark. And then diversity, don't have all your eggs in one basket. You know, it's really important that you have diversified income streams because it, uh, it mitigates risk. 
Um, if you have massive crop failure or whatever, if you've got something else that's coming along, it gives you an option um, for your business to continue trading. We're seeing at the moment hospitality sector hugely hit by COVID. Well, there is no other in income stream with a lot of those businesses. Yes, they've tried to get into uh, takeaways out of pubs and things like that. And that's a way of doing it, but you should be thinking about it in advance. And then, you know, are the skills available? So where you've got a diversification enterprise and you want to do something different, you've got that field that, you know, you could put glamping pods on it. You need to have the skills available on the farm because I've seen it so many times where people set up new ventures, but don't actually have the skills. They've got the resources, they've built the project, but then they can't deliver it. I remember once going to see a guy with a farm shop and, uh, and he couldn't understand why it wasn't, it wasn't getting going. It was just wasn't working. And I was stood to him, with him talking in this farm shop and he had all his overalls on after just coming out of the milking parlor. He stank. And that's why there was nobody in the farm shop. And it's just, you know, it's, you need to match diversification enterprises to the skills available as well as the resources. And then just recognizing the fact that unless you're producing a niche market product, you are a commodity producer. And the only way really you can control your gross margin is by looking at your costs. And um, you have, we have, uh, wheat in, is, is the classic example. Other than the futures market with wheat, there's, it's the global market, full stop, it's a global market. And weather downturns happen all over the world and, and the market is traded globally. So there isn't a lot you can do about a wheat price, you can, but you can manage your cost of production and understand your cost of production. And then finally, um, change. So again, this is a behavioral thing. And I always talk about the grief cycle when I think about change, because this is so wrong and if you th so right. And if you think about a change in your life, it, it goes through these stages. So you deny it to start with. It's not gonna happen, don't worry, it's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, they're talking about uh, BPS disappearing, but it won't happen. And then something else will come up. So that's the denial phase. And then the anger phase is, well, <laughs> I'm not accepting that. I don't want that to happen. And, and then, you know, you start to, when the reality starts to kick in, there's a depression phase. And then there's a, there's a sort of negotiation. Well, maybe if, if I don't do that, I can do this. And, and maybe if I give you that, you'll give me this. And then eventually there's acceptance. And the, the whole idea around the grief cycle is knowing where you are. Knowing as you are as a person and as a business, how to get to the next phase and accepting that this is where, you, this is the phases that you will go through. But if you adopt and recognize each stage, it ends up as acceptance at the top at the end of the day. And it's, it's how you deal with change that's really important. But I always have a mindset that change will happen. And you, if you accept that change with, will happen, it's just a matter of how you deal with it. So really in summary, I wanna just come back to what the high performing farm looks like. So thinking of everything we've just talked about, um, the elements I just wanna go through are uh, not many, but these are the elements that I consider and uh, do make a high performing farm. So challenging thinking, not accepting the survivor mentality of this is the way we've always done it. There is another way and let's have a think about that. And then having an engaged labor supply, you know, not every farm employs people, but if you employ people, they need to be engaged. They need to be communicated with, they need to be understood and they, they need to be motivated. Care of your soil. I mean, this is, this is the carbon thing. Soil is massively, massively under managed and underappreciated, but it has got huge value to every farming business. Care of machinery to minimize cost. A little bit expensive that uh, 
fancy green or red or whatever colour it is piece of kit. Um, but it's got to be cared for because it's got to last because it costs a lot and it won't get cheaper, it'll get more expensive. And then, you know, using some sort of diversification enterprise just to add that, uh, that element of, um, of, of risk mitigation. So having different enterprises and, and where possible, you know, things like bed and breakfast pig units that are pretty risk free, apart from the capital you have to spend on them. You don't own the pigs, you don't own the, uh, the feed, so you've got no fluctuation there. So you know the repeatability of the income stream without too much doubt. Perfect example of a diversification that is not, it's agricultural diver diversification that is mitigated against risk. And then land has got a massive value and I don't know where the land price is gonna go over the next five, six, seven years, but it is a huge part of a balance sheet on a farm. And so maximizing that value of land is really important talked about budgeting and benchmarking, don't want to go there anymore, but it's massively important to know your direction in terms of the finances. Cost every operation, use the technology. You know, Harp is a great place for engaging with new technologies. Get farmers to take this message home, get farmers to engage with that technology. And then focus on the detail. The people who focus on detail are normally successful because they focus on the detail. So that's it from me, Thomas. I don't know quite how long it's taken me. I maybe should have been watching, but um, open to questions now. Yeah, um, all of you guys watching, you should be able to um, unmute if, if you wish, or feel free to type if you um, don't wish to to ask them verbally i'll look in the in the q a um, <laughs> all a bit shy you'll have to ask one to <laughs> so from from a student's perspective um how would you could you uh kind of advise students to kind of Go, go into a business with some some re with some recommendations and and get their voice heard. You know, if they were going in on, in on placement, for example. Yeah. Uh, on on the placement, it's really difficult, um, because I think sometimes uh, you would always feel that you know you're grateful for the placement. You wouldn't want to upset the apple cart, so to speak. I think with something like that, it's getting to understand and, and know the type of person. You know, we talked a lot there about behaviours. It's sort of getting to understand and know the characters you've got that you're working on a placement with. Because, yeah. you know, and having some sit downs with the farm business manager or the, or the farmer himself and just get a feel for what sort of guy is this, you know. Try and segment him like, like we like we talked about earlier. Try and put him in one of those box on those boxes. I would suggest that if you're on a placement on a farm, he won't be a survivor because he won't want somebody coming in on the farm, uh, telling him all sorts of new ideas. Usually, you would expect that people farmers who take placement students will have an open mind. Mm. But I would I would always listen and just make an assessment. And similarly at home, you know, I remember when I came from home, uh, came home after I've been to Harper, I wanted to change the world, you know, I wanted to do yeah. everything. And, and I had a dad that was quite, you know, he was quite, um, he was quite engaging and he did, you know, did let me do quite a few things, which was great. And, uh, and similarly, you know, next generation on, I got a 26 year old on the farm at home. When I was MD at Promar, I was three or four nights away every week. And he ran the farm and, um, you know, he got to hold the, the reins very early. And, uh, and I think that's where we as, a, as an agricultural community need to start thinking. It's you guys that are, you're the future leaders. You're the ones who, 
you know, should be pulling the strings. And I think you know, on farms at home, it's very difficult because, you know, it's um, convincing, <laughs> convincing mum and dad that what you're talking about makes sense. But, you know, this, this I, you know, the whole idea of the agricultural transition is a great opportunity. And I would say that, you know, at the moment, I'd part, you know, I really apologise for the plug here, but we've actually got a campaign running at the moment to try and get on more farms and just as a free service, just to map out what the profitability and what the requirement for profit on a farm is and see how that's going to change over the last seven years. But just doing something like that and just sitting down and, okay, my farm's making a profit, but what is the profit requirement? Um, and where's that going to be in seven years' time? Hmm. How's it going to look in, in that yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> any, any, any other questions? Um, feel free to, to ask away. Um, you know, I'm sure James won't mind. Um, you know, all sorts. Um, but, you know, if not, um, thank you, James, for, for your time this evening. Um, it's been really interesting. And we'll, um, we'll get the, the video trimmed down so we don't have our little chat at the beginning and then it'll be going up onto mm -hmm. our YouTube. So I'll, um, I'll share the link with you. So if you want a copy of it, and um, I'll, get it, I'll get a copy right. to you. Beginning of Great. And then, like I say, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch, it doesn't cost anything. And, um, you know, happy to have a chat with any of, any of your students, um, if they've got something they want to talk through, fine. No, that's great. Thank you very much. All right. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Thank you very no much. Problem. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.